us. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of the Lord today, shall we seek his guidance so we may more clearly understand that which he is presenting to us? Shall we pray? Loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to assemble together. We thank you for this guidance that you are providing within the scripture of truth. We ask, Father, for your direction. We ask your blessing as we open your word. We ask that our minds may be open to understand that which you would have us to understand at this time. We seek to find the applications that you are presenting for our time from that which is the time of the past, which all of the prophets had desired to see. Help us now, Father, guide us, show us that which we should know. May a blessing be upon each one that is here today. Help us to clearly understand that which you would want us to know. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we were covering yesterday, in Judges 2.8 and 2.9, we are again seeing the repetition of part of the end of the book of Joshua. So Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of the inheritance in Timnath Heres, or Timnath Serah, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill, Gaash. Now, you were making a comment yesterday, Theodore, that, that the names are basically a Hebrew play on words. Yeah, so they take the 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 son Harris, and they just write it in reverse because in Hebrew it's just an exact. So you got Samak Resh and Chet, or Chet uh, Resh and Samak. So either way, so so it's intentional, and and Hebrew does these types of things all the time. So. So something there might have to do with, because it has to do with sun worship or something like that, that they choose to reverse it to be uh, Sarah okay. instead of Harris. Why would this be something important for us today? What would we see here? How can, how can we see this? Okay, well, there's a number of things. One is just from a, a practical way of understanding the Hebrew mind. Sure. They, they, they use puzzles, riddles, clues um, to illustrate truth. They use puns, uh, things like that. And, uh, I mean, the question is why. One is because they can hide a lot of meaning in a few words. Okay. Because so, the Bible is very concentrated. It's a very dense uh, book. It doesn't have filler. And now some of these things, they would be recognized immediately by somebody who reads Hebrew. Right? Obviously, the English translation, you're not going to notice this as readily. You're not going to see that Sarah is Harris backwards, especially when they put it as, you know, sort of use different vowels and stuff. But um, so the city of the sun, and 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 so it's understood that it's the city of the sun. Now, now Sarah means something different. I can't remember what it meant. Uh, um, so that was. Let me see, Joshua twenty four three. Now we also have something too, which which we have to go back to, and that has to do with Bokim. Right. Um, because that's really the similar type of thing that they do in Hebrew, where they where they talk about the name of a city sort of in a, we might think of it in a, in a sort of a hidden way. Uh, 
but it's actually to illustrate something. And you see this when, you know, they come to, um, like, Bethel. Originally, it, it talks about this place. And then it's named Bethel. And then it's told you it was called Luz at the first. I think that's, is that correct? Bethel was called Luz, right? Right. But they don't tell you that. They don't say he came to, to uh, Luz. They just say he came to this place. And they, and they use the word place quite a few times. Um, where is it here? Because that's in Genesis 28. Right. Um, yeah, in 28 verse 11, he lighted upon a certain place. And now this word place is an extremely important word. Um, it's it's Macomb, and we would recognize that as part of the uh, well. It relates to Daniel chapter eight. It also relates to Jehoiachim and Jehoiakim. So there's two different words for place that are are very similar. Uh, and uh, so, but anyway, in Genesis, so I'll come back to that. So in Genesis twenty eight verse 11 it, it says a certain place and he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep and this word place um, can be used for a place of a sanctuary so um, so th so they noticed that place is there three times in that sentence and then in uh, when he calls the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And this, this happens other places as well, where you, you talk about a place, but you do, and, and then you might attach some meaning to it, and then it's named, and then they tell you what it was originally called. So this is a pattern. So these types of things are, are clues or keys to help us understand symbolic representations of things, that there's, it's, it's drawing our attention to something. So the same thing happens with, you know, things like uh, the 2300 evenings and mornings in Daniel chapter nine or chapter eight. Well, why is it say evenings and mornings? Well, because a symbolic representation of a day is given to you so that you can understand its importance, that it is a symbol. Same thing with um, uh, when they use the word Sheba in, in Leviticus 26 in, a, in an ungrammatical way. Yeah, so uh, Sarah means superfluidity, redundancy, uh, to stretch or extend. Okay, so, um, so these examples, these things in Hebrew that we don't really use at least theologically in English we might use them for humor for the Hebrews they're not about humor uh, they're to draw our attention to something so so I would say the fact that the place is not named uh, its actual name but called Bochum um, in in that part of Judges chapter 2 dealing with Bochum and then also here you have Timnath Heres or Timnath Sira uh, knowing that they're the same place but they're they're written differently it's it's telling you something what it is telling you specifically the most important thing that it's telling you or at least it's telling you that you need to look at it right we need to examine it yeah it's like highlighting something right that okay. there's something here that's just not on the surface that that's meant for study that's that's why it's done and that that it's a symbol that there's a symbol attached to it. So, um, I mean, that's kind of a long explanation, but it's not the longest explanation. Um, hopefully, that helps. That makes sense. But it, it helps us in this in this regard that our attention is being called to this. It's not something for us to pass by. It's something for us to give consideration upon. Mm -hmm. So if we are to give consideration upon this, is this something that 
is then a symbol of something else for this movement. Where this is being called upon for our consideration is this like a, shall we say, a stop sign telling us that we need a, a deeper understanding of what's being said? Um, well, yeah. Um, so, so the thing about uh, this Timnath Sira itself, right? So we have it in, in Joshua, it's called Timnath Sira, but it's going to call, be called Timnath Harry's here in Judges. Okay. Um, so could this be telling us something about a mirror? Or is it just really a repetition? Because, well, it says a redundancy, but like is it, it's in superfluidity, superfluous, which, which generally we would take as meaning uh, unnecessary. Okay, so if this is if this is a type of a mirror, yeah, we have a a type of vision, a mirror that is like the looking glass of the women. Well, or just a chiasm. I guess the point that I'm, I'm trying to ask is, is this possible when we're comparing the three different types of visions? Yeah, I'm, yeah I know. I know what you're talking about. I'm just not sure if that, that's, that's how I would apply it. Okay. Unless we somehow tie those to the idea of a structural chiasm. Because I right. think it's referring more to a chiasm rather than to a particular type of vision. Okay. But maybe maybe the two are connected in some way. You can okay. maybe connect Sierra uh, to your like a remnant. That which remains. So it's an opposite to like the sun. You have like the remnant. So with the Sunday law, you have the remnant potentially. Yeah. Well, well that definitely can be true. That it, it's it's giving us that kind of symbol. But I'm just thinking it's also telling us something structurally regarding these stories as far as a line is concerned. That is, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that there's something, there's some kind of chiasm in this history, in these lines, because not all lines have chiasms to them. At least not, not in the way that we think of, you know, a chiasm where you have... Uh, a structural chiasm of time, dates. But there must be some connection here because it's it's going back to the beginning. It's repeating or reiterating a story. And and yet we we have a hard time placing it. And, and it could be just that this story, it's talking about its symbolic nature, the end from the beginning. And I know I'm not being really clear but but it's just weird that in Joshua they give it one name and judges another and that name is a mirror of itself at the end since our goal is to try to place all of this on a line mm -hmm. is this adding to or detracting from our main goal? Well, it would be adding to it. Because every every little bit of information adds to it. Okay. But, but, but that's the thing is this is very complex, this whole section that we've been dealing with for a couple of months. Um, you know, it's not it's not as straightforward as as I would like this line to be. Because it, it brings us, we have this, the line of Joshua, which is very complex in and of itself. But now we get the story of Judges sort of intermingled 
you know, even at the beginning of the judges, it's going back to stories much earlier in the time of Joshua. And then at the end of the judges, it goes back to stories at the beginning of judges. Right. So, so there's something about the structure of these stories. There's something about the names of Timnath, Syria, or Harry's, um, which, which is telling us information about the structure of these lines. Now, to somebody looking on who doesn't know anything about our movement, they would just think we're kind of talking gobbledygook. Um, you know, that we, we don't really, you know, it would be just sort of hidden to them. They wouldn't know what you mean about these mirrors and these lines. But to me, this all exists in the context of Leviticus 26. Because we know that, um, and, and we have this story here, and this goes back to Bethel and Gilgal, which has still some puzzles that we haven't solved yet. Um, that that we kind of have to bring together. So we know if Bochum is Bethel, we know that um, Bethel is the house of God. Now Gilgal is where the sanctuary is going to be, and and then the sanctuary is going to be moved to where? Shiloh. Yeah, to Shiloh. Um. So so we have Shiloh which is where the sanctuary is. We have Bethel, which is the house of God, which is this, I mean, Bethel's tied up with all these different stories that, that ties them together. And that's one thing we find about locations is that they do tie stories together. So when something happens at a location and something else happens at that location and something later happens at that location, we can see that they're going to be illustrating parallel lines. Correct? Right. So, so this angel of the Lord of Christ coming and going from Gilgal to, to Bethel, which we're going to see that Bochum is Bethel, um, uh, becomes really important, especially in the context of he's going to talk about the seven times. I swear unto your fathers and said, I will never break my covenant with you. So that swear is the word Shava, which means to uh, repeat, repeat a declaration seven times. Right, it's an oath. So the seven times oath is tied up here, and we just haven't put it all together yet. Right. Um, so I, I know I threw a bunch of ideas there. The idea of this word place or makum. So when you go to um, uh, uh, the kings, right? So let me see if I can find this here. So you're going to have. Um, so you have Jehoiakim. Do you want to share your screen? Well, yeah, cool. I'll share my, my screen here. So just, just dealing with this word place and, and the significance of this. So here you have Jehoiakim. And this is my Bible here. I've got to make this bigger. Just hang on. Now, you'll see that there is um, these words here, Yehovah, and this other word, kum. Now, kum uh, means place. But, you know, it, it also means, like they'll have here, to rise. You know, we we'll often say it has to, to build up or stir up or strengthen. It's got all these different meanings. But it's, it's related to the word place because a place is where something is built up. So you're going to pitch something or build it up. And um, and then the other one is Jehoiachin, Chim, I mean, Jehoiachin. So you're going to have, uh, where's this here? That's Zephaniah, Zedekiah. OK, so here we go here. And so Jehoiachin, you'll see, again, he's going to have this other word, though, which is kum. So kun and kom, they're spelled differently, but they both mean the same thing. And, and in Hebrew, that's sort of like a pun. And then when we go to Daniel chapter 8, 
and where it talks about the place of his sanctuary was cast down, it's got this word makom. So what they did is they put a mem in front of this word kon, right? So this, this is an established place, a fixed place or a foundation, right? So when we go back to this, um, that was in, I remember which verse I was in, uh, find it here. That was in Genesis, so it's like 28 or something. 28, 11? Yeah. Yeah, so Jacob, and he comes to this place, you'll see that's the word makom. Now makom, which is, it's a mem and it's a kof, a vav and another mem, right? So those are the Hebrew letters. Um, that's going to be, uh, and if you look this up, you'll see that it's, um, uh, I'll just find some verses. There's lots of different verses that use it. Um, so this is just this general word for place. And, and we looked at this when we looked at Daniel chapter 8. I don't know if people remember. But... So there's one that's a place of a sanctuary and one that isn't. And there's too many things for me to look at here. Um, Are you getting distracted? Well, there's just too many things. <laughs> I can't, I can't, there, too many verses to look at. I can't remember all the verses. Um, but anyway, it's a different one than the one in, um, Daniel chapter 8, right? Okay. So, so they look similar. Like in English, they look similar because they sound the same almost. So the place of his sanctuary, this is the makon. This one's mem, uh, kaf. So instead of the kof, so kaf and kof kind of sound like the same letter to us, right? Right. But they're different letters. And then instead of ending with an, a mem, it ends with a, a noon. It's got the final noon at the end. So that's an N sound, makon. And so when, when you're dealing with Jehoiachim, Chin, and Jehoiakim, Kim is the one with end, with end, which ends with the mem. And, of course, Jehoiakin is the one that ends with the noon. So they both mean this place or a stab of foundation. Which, where, which is which something is built upon. Um, so I know I'm kind of going astray a little bit here, you know, from this point. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we need to pay attention to these words. And um, when we get to Judges, so we'll just go back to Judges here, chapter 2. And we're dealing with this idea of bokim. Um, God is showing us something about these cities. So when He talks about a city, they'll often call it a place, or they'll 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 have some story of how that city is going to be named. But then they'll tell you it used to be called this. So in tr in trying to illustrate that uh, bokim is Bethel. Uh, we need to look at a number of different verses. So, um, and I don't have these all set up, but, okay, so we know Gilgal is a wheel, right? All right. And Bokim is the weepers. Now, right. <clears throat> and, and then Bethel, of course, is the house of God, Right. So right. got different names. So that's what I got to do. Um, okay. So we go back to Bethel. That's what we need to do. I know this is a little bit of a study. 
So when we go back to Bethel, Bethel is first mentioned um, in Genesis chapter 12. Right, and this is Abram, and he removed from hence unto the mountain on the east of Bethel. Now, the question is, when is Bethel named? When is it named Bethel? Well, isn't it when Jacob comes to that area and calls it Bethel after he's had the, the vision of the ladder between heaven and earth? Right. So, but here it's called, it's being called Bethel in Genesis chapter 12 before it's named Bethel. Right? Right. We, we that? Okay. So this is actually Luz at the time. But right. when it's being written, they're going to say it's Bethel. And, and, and Bethel has all these things associated with it, all these different stories. Um, so Abraham comes to Bethel. And, and we know in, in Genesis 13, 3, um, when, when it talk, Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called, the name, called on the name of the Lord. So it's still, it's still not called Bethel, but they're calling it Bethel. Right? So it's going to be called Bethel in Genesis 28, 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Lazit the first. Um, now, then in Genesis 31, 13, um, where you see uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowedest a vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kinder, kindred. So what's being associated here with Bethel now? The place of the kindred. Well, it's also the place of, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. All right. right. Now, um... So what else? Now, we also have Bethel mentioned in context of, of um, with the Oak of Weeping. That's Genesis 35 uh, here. So this is going to be, um, where is it? Here. So. Uh, that's a, okay, so remember, uh, you're going to have, and they journeyed from Bethel, to, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, son of my sorrow, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way of Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And so there's something here in this story. And so there you have Bethel mentioned. And then we have, I, I probably should have written this all out. I went through it before. Um, oh, it's Genesis 35, 8. So if I went back here. Um, so Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under the oak, the name of which, uh, or the name of it was called Alon Bakoth. So that is uh, the oak of weeping. Right, so it, uh, let me see here, right, the Oak of Weeping. And 
So you got the word alon, which is oak, and then bakith. And that's that's basically where we get the word bokim from. So we have Bethel here. Um, and, and here the place is called El Bethel, which is just it's the same place. Um, and Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, right? So we can see that weeping is associated with Bethel. Is this making sense to people? It's what it's doing is it's calling out this place and telling us that we need to pay attention to the place. Yeah. Now, Amos 4.4 4 is probably a little more explicit in this sense of connecting Bethel. Now, because remember, Bochum is only mentioned in that one place in Judges. Right. So we, we don't have Bochum mentioned per se. Uh, in Amos 4.4, 4, it says, come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. So here you have Bethel and Gilgal connected. And you're going to see other places where they're connected as well. So the idea that, that Christ comes from Gilgal and goes to Bethel makes sense. To go to some place that's never been known of and never mentioned again doesn't really make sense. But we can see there's this association between these two places. Um, so there's probably more. Uh, Yeah, so you have other places where Bethel and Gilgal are mentioned together. So Bethel is a place of rebuke. And there's more in Amos chapter 7. And also we know about the altar at Bethel with the false worship with Jeroboam. So in this with Amos 4.1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor and crush the needy, which, which say to their masters, bring, let us drink. And then we're, we're coming back into this with Bethel mm -hmm. and Gilgal. So is this the movement that's being compared to cattle or is this the, uh, the Protestants? Hmm. Well, I mean, God isn't giving a message to the Protestants. He's comparing us to them because of our association. Right. With them. So are we being called cattle? Um, well, yeah. So we're being shown that this prophecy hear this word you cattle of bashan why is bashan being called out well that's the area that's on uh, the east of the jordan okay um that's um because you have gilead and bashan on there and that's that's that really rich pasture land so in other words is the rich pasture land the a symbol of both the light and the word of god that that has been given to the church over these last many years yeah, that ends up being rejected right yeah because yeah, god has blessed his people but they they continue to transgress right because then when you go into this with Amos 4, 2, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Is this, I mean, he's making it clear that he's willing to make us righteous by faith, but we are rejecting the need of faith. We're working, we're, we're too focused on the works rather than the faith. Yeah. Yeah, and this, of course, is the seven times again. The, right. Yeah, the sworn. This is the oath. He's made an oath by his holiness, or he's sworn by his holiness. 
which is um, Kodesh, right? right? So that's 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 where you get the word uh, in Hebrew for the sanctuary is Kodesh, or Mikdash for just a sanctuary in general, but Kodesh Hakodesh for the holy place and Kodeshim for the most holy place. Okay. Or, um, holy and holies. But anyway, so so we can see that this is all tied together. And Bethel, Bethel would have to be what's being referred to in Judges chapter 2. I mean, I know I didn't do a very well-organized study on it. But if you, if you compare the different scriptures dealing with Bethel and Gilgal and, and so forth, and, and the events that happen in Bethel, you can see it's associated with weeping. And so the place of the weepers would be Bethel. And it, it would, and it's understood that way. So, I mean, I'm trying to use the biblical arguments, but the right. Jews understood that it was Bethel. Uh, the Septuagint translators understood it was Bethel. Right? So it's it's not some strange interpretation. It's just always been understood that Bochum is Bethel, but you can show it from the scriptures, because that's how people came to understand it by understanding. So, in other words, from the Hebrew and from the Greek, the Septuagint and from the Hebrew scripture, we're able to see that the the city of Bethel and Bochim are the same thing. It's just they. It's another time period in which the city is being denominated yeah they're giving it this name and and they don't need to tell you that it's bethel even though when you look at i think it's judges 2 verse 5 um it's one of these verses anyway in here they plainly say it's bethel in the septuagint so they 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 clearly show you that bokim is bethel okay that was understood but yeah, us reading it here in English, we would just think it's some other town. But the only town that makes sense is Bokum because of its association with the Reapers. Well, okay, but here's here's a city then that in scripture would have three names. Right? Well, Bethel, Luz, and Bokum. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we are applying this as a time period you have Luz before the conquest of the promised land well before Luz before um jacob so jacob changes it to bethel okay jacob being a would we say he is a symbol of the first and second angels messages well well the way that we looked at jacob abraham isaac and jacob jacob in that line represented the third angels message okay and and jo and joseph represents the fourth okay so we have done that okay. so the point being is that bokim is that for our time the representation of the judgment under the fourth angel's message. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the way that I'm looking at this is that, um, cause there's a whole bunch of things in this story that tells us this is a repeat of history. Right. Well, that's, that's the argument that I'm trying to make is that in judges chapter one and two, they're going to repeat these stories illustrating a repeat of history and you have timnath uh sarah you know and timnath harris right which is showing you this mirror and and so we we would ne need to understand that that this is illustrating a repeat of history like we have in our time if we would look at the story of joshua as parallel to the history of the millerites then this story of the judges is showing that there's this repeat of history, but then this failure. It's the failed reform line at the end of a reform line. Right. And so the history of the judges is illustrating 
the history of Adventism. But it's also illustrating the history of Adventism up to and including our history, which is a repeat of history. Does that make sense? It's logical. I mean, all these histories are illustrating our time. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's simple just to say we're, well, this story here we can apply now. But the, the question is, how do we apply it? Um, and what, what's been done in this movement with some of these histories? So this deals with some of our other studies. Uh, but when we look at, we're, we're repeating Millerite history. So we have these lines, these way marks. We say, well, at 9-11, or, you know, at 1989, the first angel arrived. 9-11, it was, it was empowered with the fourth angel. Um, and it, and then, and then we're going to have the third angel's message arrive. Just a very simple thing, let's say at the Sunday law. So, so we have these way marks, but the problem that we have in our time is the same problem we have in looking at the past in that these illustrations overlap. You zoom into a way mark, you have a reform line. That is, God is using a three-step testing prophetic message to develop and demonstrate two classes of worshipers. And, and that's always seen in these histories. But what the mistake that we sometimes make is where we are in a bigger line, that is, we mistake events in a smaller line, which is just something internal or something happening on a smaller scale. And, and then we think that we're in the bigger line. So we look at this pandemic, for instance, and we know it's a type of the Sunday law. So we think, well, this pandemic's just going to lead directly to the Sunday law happening in 2022 or 2023. But that's a mistake. Not that we're, we're trying to pl uh, present uh, um, a message. What's, I can't think of the word. Um, a smooth message. I, I, what, what do we normally say? Um, a peace and safety peace, message? Yeah, peace and safety message. We're not saying that because it, it isn't about peace and safety. We're not saying, oh, the Sunday law is a long way off. There's actually a danger here at this time that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the snares and the traps that are before us now. And, you know, when Ellen White in 1850 says, you know, Jesus is not coming back in November of 1851, that people who are setting that time are wrong, she's not giving a peace and safety message. She's just telling them that there is a danger that's before them that they're unaware of. And really, in a sense, the idea that Jesus was coming back in November of 1851, it, that was the peace and safety message. So why, why would saying a Sunday law is going to happen imminently? Why would that be a peace and safety message now? Repeat your question. So if, if somebody was saying a Sunday law is imminent. Right. And, you know, Trump's going to be reelected and all these things. Why would that be a peace and safety message now? Because it's applying what the world wants to see to. And, and trying to make it a prophetic portion of the message rather than truly looking at this as scripture is presenting it. Yeah, so as Iran says, we're skipping over, over a lot of uh, events that have to happen in connection with the Sunday law, and especially internal events. That is, people don't want to have face the problem that was exists within this movement, because the problems that exist within this movement are the problems that exist within ourselves. Right. And just saying, well, there's a Sunday law coming, we must be ready for it. I mean, we're the people who know about it. We're the ones that are safe. 
That's a peace and safety message. It's like the disciples saying, you know, Jesus is just going to overthrow the Romans. That's a peace and safety message. To know that they're going to have to go through persecution over a long period of time and have to build up this church, that's, that's a job. That's a lot of work. Those are trials that are ahead. Right. For many people, just the idea that Jesus is going to come back and the Sunday law is going to come. And, and we're just going to be safe because God's going to take care of us. And yet we haven't dealt with the root problem of sin in our lives. And, that, and that's obvious because of the problems that exist within the movement. Um, this, this, is, this is more a message of warning rather than a peace and safety message to say that we have a lot of work to do. People don't want to hear that. They just want it all to be over. So, so taking Judges chapter 2, because, I mean, we've moved on past this already, but um, this section here, verses 1 to 5, how, how do we then apply this to this movement now? What, what was our conclusions? Well, we were applying this portion, these five verses, within the light that we had addressed from Ezekiel 9. Yeah. Because the weepers are those that sigh and cry about the abomination within the land. And th this is the a, a weeping of repentance as well. Right. Because... I mean, they had made a league, and they're now recognizing this, and they're confessing, and and so this is a positive type of weeping in this case. Now, is it not also the same type of weeping that we would find in Ezra 10? Yes, yeah, on the 20th day of the ninth month. So we're dealing with two witnesses. Mm -hmm. so those that are recognizing their disobedience are coming together corporately and like daniel seeking forgiveness for his sins and the sins of the people mm -hmm. Would that, would that be a correct analysis? Mm -hmm. Does yes. anybody else have a problem with that? That again? Okay. On this, on this situation, as we have been comparing these first five verses of Judges 2 with Ezra 10, and with Ezekiel 9. Do you have a problem with these application, with these witnesses, that this is to show us our need for our seeking and repentance before God for ourselves and for the people? Similar to what, what Daniel had done. No, I think there's a connection. Okay. See, see, the thing that I have the most problem with, not just now, but in this movement for a long time, ever since I've been in it, is we're, we're no different than the church. Right. That is, we're rich and increased with goods. Yes. I think we have need of nothing. We look down on other people because we're the ones in the know. And we expect to become God's people, this, this powerful group that's going to proclaim this message. And we're unconverted. We haven't even demonstrated amongst ourselves that we have any kind of humility we, we can easily point out that somebody else is at fault. 
you know, that that person is a problem. But we can't easily see that we're the problem. And how can you expect a group of people like that to accomplish the work that God is asking us to accomplish? I just don't see that it's possible. Right? July 18th didn't work in us repentance. It didn't have brother and brother confessing their sins one to another. We never had an upper room experience at any time that I know of in this movement. Right. And yet we expect that we're going to have this looking glass vision. We're going to have this revelation of Christ when all our movement is, is a revelation of man. It's a revelation of human nature. It's a textbook example of exactly what you see in the book of Judges, of the condition of man. It's not a textbook example of Christ. Now, God's given all of us all of this light, and we somehow think because we've been given light, that makes us safe. It makes us converted. Because, you know, we know the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more to a perfect day. And, and that we, we're, fought, we're studying the Bible. God's feet is a light unto our path. Right. So we, we, we think, well, we're, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We have all this light in the spirit of prophecy, but it hasn't done the work that it's supposed to do. Um, I was reading um, uh, the book by um, uh, Samuel Snow. So Samuel Snow uh, wrote a book, The Voice of Elias, because he believed he was Elijah. Right. And, and it's interesting here. I can read a little bit of this because uh, I was studying up on Exeter because I'm writing this paper on on Exeter. Um, the time they proclaimed for the end of the world and the coming of the bridegroom was 1843. They took their lamps of scripture doctrine and went forth in faith to meet him. The wise virgins also took their lamps and followed those elder brethren and following those elder brethren went forth with them. But the bridegroom did not come in 1843. While he tarried, as the parable had foreshown, both classes of the virgins slumbered and slept. But while they were thus slumbering on the subject of time, which was then so important, and not realizing the nearness of the great event in the summer of 1844, the midnight cry was sounded. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And then he asked this question, and 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 he's he, he ended up going in this wrong course. But this question is an important question for us. It says, but who gave that cry? Not the virgins, wise or foolish, for they were slumbering and sleeping, and were by its sound aroused from their slumbers. It could not have it can have been no other but the voice of Elias or Elijah. The watchman who did not sleep upon his post. And he says, see Isaiah 21, 6 to 8. The time as proclaimed by that messenger and proved by scripture and historical facts was the 10th day of the seventh Jewish month, the day of atonement and of the sounding of the trumpet of the Jubilee in 1844. So who is he that's saying is the one that gave the midnight cry? Who was that, according to Samuel Snow? Who's he saying? Who gave the midnight cry? He says it wasn't the virgins, foolish or wise. So wasn't it Samuel Snow himself who gave the midnight cry? Wouldn't it have to be? Yeah. So he's saying he's Elijah. And of course, he went into all kinds of errors because right. of it. Now, isn't our movement Samuel Snow? Yes. Because it's not a person. And has our movement done the same as snow? Yes. Okay. So, so we have this, this dichotomy, this, this problem, too, that exists because of it. Because we know this movement has been given a message. Samuel Snow was given a message. But that message doesn't save him. 
And this movement has, has been given a message. And we trust just because the fact that God gave us light that we must be saved. But the movement, FFA, ends. It's very similar to Samuel Snow in its actions. And we always tried to, you know, I didn't say we always, but there are people who kept wanting to be Snow. And I would say to them, why would you want to be Samuel Snow? He falls away. And, and can't we see that the movement has fallen away? And so what's left is not, you know, the Millerites or FFA. What's left is what we see in, in early writings, page 74. A very scattered flock. Yeah, a scattered flock that God then is going to use. He's not going to use the great men. Right? No. FFA, right? FFA has done its work. Samuel right. Snow has done his work. But it's it's given to someone else. Many people want to hold on to, and I, I'm not, because the truth, Ellen White agrees with the midnight cry. It's not like she rejects it. But isn't it only the ones who become Seventh-day Adventists who fully understand the midnight cry? I would think so. Yeah. And, the, and people like Snow, he ends up really rejecting much of the truths that came through the Millerite movement. And that's true of FFA. It's, it's not to put down the work that Jeff accomplished. And especially even in giving uh, the July 18 uh, warning. Because that was, that was of God, just like the midnight cry given by snow was of God. But we can't trust, because God has given us light, that we are then correct in our character. God, God led the people of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea. He brought them through the wilderness. He brought them through the Jordan. He conquered the country for them with obviously them cooperating with God. But he provided deliverance, and they go into darkness. Now, the seven times when God is sworn, right? I swear unto your fathers and said, I will never break my covenant with you. This is God's covenant. Is God Has God ever broken the covenant? No. no. Have we broken the covenant? Yes. But God is still not breaking his covenant, and his covenant is an everlasting covenant. He's promising us what he can do in us, and as long as we trust in him, he can accomplish this. But if we're breaking the covenant, he can't accomplish it. So it's a little bit of a rant there, but hopefully that's helpful. It's not a rant. It's, okay. but it's it, what it what it is. It's it's laying some things out very bluntly. Okay, which is what I call a rant. But anyway, so we got, you know, so we got through. So I think we understand where we are now. But we are just before the Sunday law, and there there are those that are sighing and crying, and it's not just about what's being done in other other people. It has to be for our own sins. Yes. You have to be like Daniel, where he's he's confessing his sins, even though we don't know any sins that Daniel did. But he still sees the sins of his people as himself because he recognizes his human nature. He doesn't separate himself and distinguish himself from, from those that need to confess their sins. He feels it all as if it is his own sin, just as Christ did. So, you know, so we dealt with the death of Joshua. 
So what would be the importance then in the context of the death of Joshua? What is his death symbolizing here in this story? Is this the death to sin? No. Well, wouldn't it also be the death of Christ? Well, that most assuredly, yes. But well, I mean, the application that we're trying to make is to ourselves and to the movement. Right. So it, it has to be death to self. And is not self the equivalent of sin? Yeah. We'd also okay. see a connection with Joseph. Okay, how? Well, Joseph died when he was 110. And then uh, that's the same age as Joshua. Right. Um, in the in the 430 year period from when Abram left Haran to the Exodus. Right. Mid midway, and now there's 215 years, and that's when Joseph was 39. And then at the end of that 430 years is when Caleb is also 39. Now, it's not, we don't know the, Joshua's age, but uh, Joshua is very much connected with Caleb. Mm -hmm. So from each of them, from 215 years, you have Joseph going on to live to 110. And then from the end of the 430, you have Joshua then going on to live to 110. Yeah, and of course we have the burial of the bones of Joseph and um, that's in, in the book of Joshua. What is that, the last bit of that? Joshua's death and burial, when it's mentioned there, you have Joseph mentioned as well. Right. So... Um, yeah, the bones of Joseph are brought there, and they also mention that Eliezer, the son of Aaron, and he's buried in a hill that pertains to Phineas. So it mentions the death of these three, but Joseph and Joshua are definitely are connected here. They're just not, Joseph's not mentioned in the book of Judges in that context with the death of Joshua. But that's, that it's intriguing the way that Stephen presented that and the way that you just presented it because of the connections between Joshua and Joseph both. Yeah. 110 years. And Joseph also has 11 attached to him because he's 11 years after he sold into slavery to the dreams of the butler and baker. And then another 11 years, making the 22 years until he's united with his brethren. But he's also the 11th son. Yeah, he's the 11th son. And when he's 17, he sold into slavery, and 11 times 17 is 187. Right. So so there's a whole bunch of symbols there, um, the 22 generations, the 11 generations, the 11 years and the 11 years, um, and the 110 years. And the doubling of that then is 220, right? So Exactly. Okay. So you can go back to your screen if you want. Okay, the question is asked in the chat, could Bochum also be connected with Matthew 23, 37 to 39? Jesus wept over the impenitence of Jerusalem and the church, but the penitents in Judges 2 weep because of their sorrow for their sins. A similarity and a contrast in these verses. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things about Jesus' lamentation of Jerusalem is the doubling. Right. Right. Um, and the mention of the house, of course, that's that's uh, Beth. Um, yeah, I mean, this isn't isn't Bethel, but or Bochum, but but it's a symbol of it.
Okay. All right, so sharing the screen. So as we have gone through these verses on review, we now come to this verse, Judges 2, verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. There arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So, as the translators compared this, it's inter interesting to see the definitions of knew not the Lord. It began with Exodus 5, verse 2. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Then we come to 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. You have one on one side, Pharaoh, who was choosing to accept that he was as a god. And he's making the comment that he does not know the Lord. He does not know this God. And he's making the application that he should know God because he is a God. Now you have this where the sons of Eli know not the Lord. How can you serve in the tabernacle, in the temple, be of the leadership of the church or the movement? And not know the Lord. Is this not also a condemnation of us today? If we're not noting our sin, our need of repentance, can it be said that we don't know the Lord? First Chronicles 28, verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imagination of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. In establishing righteousness by faith, in coming to an understanding of righteousness by faith, we have to accept the fact that God is going to seek our heart, our mind, everything about us. If we're not willing to surrender this, are we going to be righteous by faith? Jeremiah 9, 3, and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord, along with Jeremiah twenty two sixteen, 16, he judged the cause of the poor and the needy, then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then, when you know not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Compared with 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, 
in this inflaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. Is this not a reference to those that reject the messages of Revelation 14 and of Revelation 18? Because is that not truly the gospel? And the final verse, Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Here, I think we're looking at the the messages of the angels of Revelation 14 in reverse. The reprobate, we're not going to come in the first angel's message. We're not going to fear God. If we're disobedient, we're not going to give glory to him. And if we're abominable, we don't want to view that the hour of his judgment has come. Any thoughts or questions? Any comment? I think these examples are giving us a, a pattern. And we're establishing what it means to know God because we're being shown what it means not to know him. <clears throat> Good point. Now, then we proceed here. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. Here we're being told that they did not know God. This second generation did not know God. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Now, the question I always have about this is, it's, it always seemed odd to me that you can have one generation go from you know, crossing the Jordan River to seeing all the mighty works of God and then to be serving other gods. But in their minds, they weren't really believing they were serving other gods. Well, okay. Do we have another example of this exact thing happening? Well, a couple of examples. Um, the making of the golden calves. And? And also uh, Dan and Bethel. I was thinking more of those that did not see 1840. Oh, okay. More modern. And by the death of Ellen White, they were setting aside anything and everything having to do with biblical prophecy. Yeah, and 1888, even, they would have crucified Christ if he had been there. Exactly. So, so you know, when we look at the story and we see, well, Baal and Ashtaroth, you know, it's a, we, we just think that this is just a complete rebellion. They just say, oh, we don't really believe Jehovah and we're just going to follow these other gods. But it's a gradual thing that happens. 
and it's manifested by human nature in that they're going to have idols. But they're just going to believe those idols represent God, right? It's not just that they're, they're, they're you know, joining another religion in their minds. At least that's the way that I see it. Because I, I just don't think you could just do a wholesale switch like that in one generation. No, but you you can begin to abandon exactly what God has said, because by that second generation, had they not already entered into a league and allowed a league with the nations that were around them, the, the, the very people that they were to drive out. Yeah. So when we begin on a, a path, when we are divulging, diverting from the path that God sets before us, one step on that path is turning our back upon God. It's actually just one small step, right? Yes. One very small step. So if people can believe that they're they're they believe they can imagine that they're believing the truth and serving God. And 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 just because they don't bow down to idols, they don't realize they're serving Baal and Ashtoreth instead. Do you think that W.W. W. Prescott believed he was bowing down to an idol when he he decided to write the doctrine of Christ? No, he believed he was being progressive and that he was going to uh, put the message in a proper format so that they could have the world accept the truth. Do you think that like okay. White's way of he didn't like the great controversy? Okay, do you think that Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler believed that they were divulging and diverting people from the truth when Smith stated that when Mrs. White had an open vision that this was from God, but when she gave a testimony that this was her opinion? Was G.I. Butler believing that he was diverging people's worship of God when he stated in writing that there were portions of the Bible that were not important? No, they believed that they, at least in their minds, that they were doing the right thing now in the case of smith didn't mrs white give a very clear warning that there were four angels of the adversary that were in charge of the people of uriah and harriet smith's house well i mean the but with the work that G.I. Butler had done as far as undermining the spirit of prophecy, that, would, that could just be Ellen White's opinion. Well, but the two of them as stood as two witnesses against Mrs. White. Yeah. So in the mind of some of the people, this was being established because there's a testimony of two witnesses. Yeah. But it was a testimony of two witnesses against God and against his prophet. So modern Israel, in this case, was also unfaithful. Because this would have been the same thing as the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Uriah Smith was not of the movement in 1844. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was a man that in 1844 was 12 years old. 
but by 1863 had risen to a prominent position and was able to speak and have people hear him. Our situation right now, we cannot be seen as having forsaken the Lord God of our fathers. Because we have been brought out of not just Egypt, but we have been brought away from the teachings of Babylon. When right now we are, we are dealing with a church that many of us are very familiar with, where we've accepted truths that were being put, from, put out from the Bible, but that church is now accepting spiritual formation, a Jesuit teaching. We are seeing it in the fourth generation accepting idols of those nations around us. And we have to make the decision what idols are we going to cast out of our lives? And what representation, what testimony are we going to be giving to those that we know around us that have accepted these idols? For is that not truly sighing and crying for the abomination in the land? Now, in this portion, we have a lot yet to consider. Our time for today is very short. We have less than two minutes. Any other thoughts or comments at this point? I mean, this, this is a very difficult thing to, to touch on because it's very like having an open nerve in a tooth. When you start touching on it, it hurts and you want to jump back because you don't want that kind of pain. The fact is, we're going to have to face this pain. So any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, shall we pray? Gracious Father, we come before you as did Daniel. We have sinned. We have turned our face away when we should not. We need you so that as we walk, we may walk according to the path that you would have us to walk with them. We need your guidance. We need you to show us where we have sinned, where we have gone wrong, because there are many of these sins that we do not recognize. We have buried them so deep that we need you to help us uncover them. Guide us today, Father. Be with us in all of this. Help us to return so that we may more clearly understand that, that which we need to do and that work that you would have us to perform at this time in our history. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.